So why more Lacan? We are going to read this essay, Seminar on the Purloined Letter by Jacques Lacan from 1956, for last time, but we thought we had enough to read for last time. But once we discovered that Derrida had responded to Lacan, we thought we should cover both of those, and then discover this book, The Purloined Poe, edited by John Mueller and William Richardson from 1988, that has not only those two essays and the original story, of course, but a whole bunch of others by psychoanalysts, by philosophers. They seem too good to pass up. So while this was supposed to be just sort of an addendum to <laughs> some house cleaning, at least for me, it turned into quite a lot of reading. Once we started reading the Lacan essays, the Purloined Letter seminar came up over and over and over again, whether you were reading the Fink or reading other stuff. So it seemed like a good place to go. I got a lot more out of it. We can apply what we learned last time, supposedly on the kind of stuff that Lacan means when he's talking to reading this essay. And plus, in this collection, besides all the commentary essays about the original story and about this exchange between uh, Lacan and Derrida... There's also a couple essays in here that directly interpret the Lacan essay. So I started the uh, Lacan essay and I uh, got a little easily distracted. And then I went and read the essay by the editors, Mueller and Richardson, about it first and then went back to it. And wow, it actually made sense. <laughs> Not every line, but you could pretty much figure out what he was talking about. We should give a quick summary of the Poloin letter itself, which is a story by Poe. Yes, from 1845. And in fact, I would recommend that people just stop this podcast right now. Go to, if you look up Edgar Allan Poe under podcasts or under iTunes U, you will find several different audio versions of the story, The Purloined Letter. Is there any way to give a quick overview of the three together? Why this story, why Lacan would be talking about it, and why Derrida would feel the need to respond? Why do we want to do that first? To justify why we're doing this and what the point of the episode is. Okay, so the short version would be that Poe was translated into French by Baudelaire and that just through French intellectual circles came to be somebody that people in the surrealist and psychoanalytic traditions read. So he was sort of intellectually important to people in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And then... There were people doing psychoanalytic interpretations, and among them was of Poe. And then Lacan came along and gave an interpretation of that because he thought it exemplified his theory of signifiers and signs. And he wanted, as he says at the very beginning, by studying it, you have a particularly good example of what he means. And Derrida has a significantly different view about the relationship between words and speech and signs and signification and along the lines of his notion of deconstruction. So he used as a long criticism and commentary of that seminar itself. And because they're two big dudes, they that generated a whole bunch of people talking about it. Lacan never apparently responded directly to Derrida, but you know, a whole book gets generated out of this thing. And as far as why this should be of interest to philosophers, is that something that just has to come out as we're going through it? Or we said Lacan is trying to teach us something. So if you found our last episode instructive, then, well, we'll talk a little bit more about the content of what he was trying to teach. Strangely enough, in the many essays about this exchange, I didn't actually see a lot of analysis of the point that Lacan was trying to make about the divided subject among these different people, different characters in the story and these positions in the story and the signifier somehow determining people. I didn't see a lot of philosophical analysis of that. It was more Derrida's criticism of him is not so much about that. It's just about, no, that's not how to read literature. You're just, you're a psychoanalyst and you're, you're seeing psychoanalysis wherever you look. Well, but it's also a metaphysical claim. Derrida has a criticism, his deconstruction and his focus on literature rests on a kind of metaphysical claim about the relationship between words and the things in the world and the nature of truth. And, I mean, I think that's the angle in for Lacan as well as a psychoanalyst in this sign and signifier and the way in which the world is revealed to us and the nature of truth is the angle, both which Derrida is criticizing him and also the sort of philosophical angle, not just related to identity, but the related to the notion of what things are and how we get access to them and how we know truth. I think there was more to it than him just saying that Lacan was reading psychoanalytics into literature. No, he had a positive statement too, yeah. Well, no, I think his criticism was something to the effect of Lacan sees the post story as being like a metaphor for the way in which 
signifiers determine the subject. And what he means by that is that the symbolic order in which we exist in large part determines our actions and kind of our role with respect to other agents and the order itself. And that's intended to be a criticism of an idea where signifiers designate what is signified. They're, in other words, the signifier, which is like a sign, so like a spoken word or a written word or whatever, designates a particular thing, which is its meaning, and that that somehow is a fixed structure and subjects have their own autonomy and they connect directly with the meanings of signifiers. And so that's how they use signifiers is to designate meaning. And Lacan is trying to use this story to say, no, here we have a signifier, which is this letter, which doesn't have any meaning. And we'll get into that in a second. And yet, the fact that the letter causes all these individuals to not just behave in certain ways, but to take on specific roles in reaction to the signifier is indicative of how the symbolic order signifiers can determine subjectivity or the subjects. And Derrida is going to criticize that in a number of different ways. But one of the ways in which he does it is to say that Lacan isn't really talking about the signifier. He's actually turned the story itself into a signified. And so that invalidates his interpretation. Who wants to give this story summary then? So the purloined letter is the third of three stories by Poe that are considered detective stories. And they're interesting because this is like the origin of the genre of detective stories to some extent. Mm -hmm. And directly influencing uh, Sherlock Holmes. Yes. So one of these stories before this is Murders of the Rue Morgue. And the other is, what is it? Something about Marie Roger. Anyway... It's important that this is the third story because the characters that are in the story are in these other stories and the narrator of the story makes reference to those previous incidents at the beginning of this story. So basically, there's a narrator who remains unnamed throughout the story who sets the scene that he's in Paris in the year 18-something or other. And he is sitting in a room, specifically a library, with a friend of his whose name is Dupin, D-U-P-I-N. And the whole story is told from his point of view with him relating conversations that were had by other people. So, Dupin is something of a detective mind, if you will. And while they're sitting there smoking pipes and just in silence kind of contemplating things, the chief of police comes in to ask Dupin for some help with the case. And the nuts and bolts of the case as related by the chief of police are that some royal personage who is female, who which we learn or are given to believe is the queen, received a letter which contains something in it. The contents of the letter are never disclosed, and that's important. It contains something disturbing to her, particularly disturbing when the king comes into the room where she's at. So she has this letter. It contains something we are given to understand by the chief of police that if the king finds out will be problematic or disastrous for the queen. She doesn't have time to hide the letter. So she leaves it face down right on a table. And the king doesn't notice, but they're shortly joined by the minister D, as in the letter D. And the minister is clever enough and has reason to want to take advantage of the situation. He realizes that the letter has import to the queen and he realizes what's going on. So, as they're in the course of conversation, he nonchalantly puts a letter down on the table and picks up the queen's letter instead, not arousing the notice of the king, but the queen notices everything that he does. She just can't do anything about it. So, basically, the queen gets the chief of police, tells him what's up, and directs him to go search the minister's quarters and find the letter, which the chief of police does with great gusto and detail, but he's unable to locate the source of the letter. So, he has come to Dupin for help. And Dupin says, go search the minister's quarters again and come back to me in a month if you haven't found it. I read in one of the sources that this whole thing is like the queen is in his power, the minister's power for 18 months total. So, it's really been going on quite a while. Oh, so it's like a year or something. Okay. So, it's a year and a half. Basically, the, the minister has been holding the letter. I don't know if he's been blackmailing the queen explicitly, but the fact that he has it 
it puts him in a position of power with respect to the queen, which is important. So, the chief of police goes, it comes back a month later, and he tells Dupin that they went through and searched the whole minister's residence again, and that they were unable to locate it. And side note, the chief of police had promised a big sum of money to anybody who could help him find it. And Dupin says, if you give me the money, I'll give you the letter. And the chief of police is startled, but he signs over a check, at which point Dupin produces the letter and gives it to him, and the chief of police scurries off. So, our narrator, our unnamed narrator, asks Dupin how he managed to find the letter. And Dupin tells him that he knows the minister and he went to visit him on a pretext and realized that in the same way that the queen had hid the letter in plain sight on a desk, the minister had done the same thing. And the reason why the police were unable to find it was because it was in plain sight and they were looking for something that was hidden. So, Dupin hatched a scheme where he left his snuff box as a pretext and came back the following day. He had created a duplicate of the letter. He hired somebody to create a distraction out on the street. And when the minister goes to the window to look, he replaces the letter with the facsimile that he created, which, by the way, contains kind of a little nasty gram from him because he has some kind of historical animosity with the, the minister. That's the basic mechanics of the story. A little long, I apologize, but... There's more detail, but it is a very short story, and that's all that happens in it, if you will. Yes, and I could tell that you were leaving space there for the analysis. That <laughs> for the, for instance, the when the Dupin goes back and gets the letter, it's not like lying on a desk, but it is out. It is hanging in a letter carrier, little mailbox, seemingly multi cubicle thing, as far as I could understand. In the leaves of the fireplace, which was important because that's like the legs. Oh, so it's yeah. like she, he's pulling it out of the uh, out of the vagina of the fireplace. <laughs> well, the point is that the minister used the same strategy, which was to hide it in the open as opposed to concealing it, you know, in a vault or behind books or whatever the case may be. Just in terms of interpretation, and we'll I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but I was interested with your turn of phrase about saying that it wasn't concealed, but it's out in the open. And I found this a little bit confusing in the interpretations because, of course, it is concealed, right? Mm, yeah. It's just concealed in a different way. And it's dressed up so it looks like something different. It's out in the open so that its sign that it's on the outside is not reflective of what it is on the inside. The prefect goes around looking at things that look as they appear and then expects that something will be stuffed in them. So, they'll be like a box. And rather than looking at other things with different kinds of covers. But it's not as if it's not hidden. In either case, with the queen, who just by turning it over, hides it. And with the minister, who hides it by concealing it to look like an old ratty letter in his regular letter box, so it looks like anything else. And the same thing with Dupin, the way he reproduces that hiddenness. So, that's fair. The minister does represent it as something that it's not. So, the police are looking for the letter itself. They're expecting the letter to be as described, just not visible, that they'll have to uncover something to find it. And instead, what the minister does is not hide it, but change essentially the way it looks so that it is not as it should appear to the police. And because the police have a certain way of seeing the world, they're unable to locate it because they can't conceive that the letter would not look like it has been described to them. Yeah. When Dupont is bragging to his friend, the narrator, about this afterward, he compares it to a game. It's like rock, paper, scissors. He talks about odds and evens, but I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Two kids are playing rock, paper, scissors, and one of them, I did rock the first time. And then what do you expect me to do the second time? Well, you probably expect me to change to something else to kind of keep you off your guard. So I'm going to outthink you and you rock again. And it's that kind of trying to anticipate what the other person thinks you're going to do. And it, according to Dupont's analysis, to be good at this, you have to be able to think like the other person. And the more clever the person is, obviously, 
the police have a certain level of cleverness. So they're like looking in the chair legs and all this stuff that would be pretty tricky to do. You know, police chief is bragging about how there's no such thing as a hidden compartment in a suitcase. You can tell by looking at the widths or we looked at all the books and there's certain ways of hiding things in the bindings of books. So there's a certain cunning the way that the police do things, which is the cunning they expect out of criminals. But because the minister is an intellect of a class above that, then the minister just can't think outside the box in that way. And I was reminded of the scene in The Princess Bride where the guy has the poison. <laughs> Iocane powder. <laughs> yes. There's a lot to the story. And like I said, it's quite short. So there really is no excuse if you're in any situation where you can stop and hit pause and go read it even online. It'll only take you about 10 minutes. But it's a wonderful little story. It's easy to see why it attracted so much attention from these interpreters. At which point we can jump in and try to talk about Lacan's interpretation? What might be interesting as a way to introduce Lacan is to refer to psychoanalytic reading in general. So there's another essay in this book by Marie Bonaparte, a descendant of Napoleon, Selections from the Life and Works of Edgar Allan Poe, a Psychoanalytic Interpretation. And it's written before Lacan's. Lacan definitely read it. He has a couple of places where he kind of rips into her. And then I read that they had a whole personal background. Anyway, she was personally acquainted with Freud. Lacan never actually met Freud. And in fact, turns out that at one point Freud visited Paris. Lacan could have met Freud, but he would have had to go to Bonaparte and ask to be in introduced. And he so didn't like Bonaparte at that point that he wouldn't do it. Wow. I didn't know that. It's very much like the cattiness on our Freud episode that we talked about between him and Jung and other folks like that. That tradition continued and Lacan at one point got basically kicked out of the psychoanalytic association. And so I had to start his own school, essentially. And so in this Bonaparte one, which I did not read all of, but I looked through it and it's exactly what you would expect a Freudian analysis to be. It says stuff like you could see all the characters in Poe are different kinds of wish fulfillment. Fulfillment. Like this character is a version of Poe. The Dupont character is like Poe saying how awesome he is. It's a version of himself, but yet the narrator is also a version of himself. And pretty much all the characters are versions of himself. And then it says things like the fireplace is a giant pair of legs and the, the knob on the fireplace is like a clitoris. And it makes these really directly sexual analyses, which are not particularly blatant in Lacan. Lacan is more focused on his theory of speech, of course. Yeah, he has a whole paragraph that goes into that. He embraces that whole interpretation. He explicitly does. Of sexualizing the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that it doesn't run through it the way in Bonaparte's essay it does, but he definitely brings that section up. In fact, to the point that Derrida ends up making fun of him for it. Right. And there is some disagreement. For instance, nowhere in the essay does Lacan use the word castration or phallus. Derrida interprets Lacan's analysis as being directly about the exact kind of circle that we talked about last time of the child and the mother and the object A, father, and then the thing that is the object A that gets associated with the father is the phallus. So it's the mother's phallus is what the letter is. Who knows if this is a legitimate interpretation of Lacan. I don't think it's so crazy what Derrida does in this because Lacan leads off with saying we need to read this in the psychoanalytic tradition and he sets out at the beginning that this is the lens through which he's going to do this. And if he doesn't go all castration and phallus all over this particular essay, if you were familiar with any of his other stuff. To make it consistent, which isn't crazy to me that you would do that. But it also makes sense to me that Derrida would go in that direction in a derisive nature that he wants to continue to make. Mm -hmm. Lacan starts off the essay by saying that the point of, that we're discussing here, and this, I guess, originally was brought up in the context of another seminar. So this seminar on the Purloin letter is actually the first essay in Ikri, right? Writings. But it, that's because it was reworked from something that was in a longer seminar. And the specific part was about the repetition automatism. Why do we keep doing destructive things, pretty much? And that's what drove Freud to posit the death drive, because he thought that there's no other way if you just think that we do everything for sexual reasons or for security, that kind of thing, that we would persist in these negative patterns. So there must be some counterforce to the cathectic energy. <laughs> Man, I wish Wes was on so he could... <laughs> <laughs> Give us the Freudian language. There must be some counterforce to the libido that is pulling us down at the same time the libido is sort of pushing us up. Once you get in the realm of the symbolic, and remember we were saying last time that language is seated in the other. So you're getting beyond the individual. And that's what's so innovative about the Kant's analysis here is he talks about the symbolic as a pattern between multiple people, that it's not just one person acting 
acting out some kind of symbolic command, but it's the symbolic that sets up a framework that thereby sets up how multiple people act. And in terms of our question last time about the subject, this almost makes it look like the subject is not an individual, which I think that's something that I had said at the end of last episode that I was very confused by of how the subject fit into all this, that we have the the ego, but that's not the subject. We have the unconscious, but is that really the subject? That's None of these correspond to who we truly are, if that's what you meant by the subject, like a Cartesian soul or something like that. He says the symbolic order is constitutive of the subject. So it's those relations that you're talking about, these symbolic relations are what make up the subject. Make up the individual subject, or can we even think of subject as something that in effect ranges across people because... No, I think it's the latter. If you want to be relatively loose about your definition of identity, you would say it's those relations that make up the subject as an individual. But when he's using language like constitutive of the subject, it makes it a lot looser and it doesn't allow it to have placehood as much. So all these questions of soulfulness lying in a body and stuff like that don't apply as well. It's more diffuse than that. By having these relations, these symbolic relations, the symbolic order, you don't have to have that be residing in a body. But Lacan would be totally fine with that. But I think he would also be fine with understanding loosely that that's what your identity is as a one, I don't want to say being because I think he's trying to move away from some of that. But as a one entity, what you call your I is made up of the symbolic order. Well, and it's split across. Yeah. That's the whole idea of the split subject. So it's partly the ego, which is, we were saying last time, is imaginary. And I know I kept emphasizing that imaginary was the same as illusory, but you could say imagistic. If you didn't want to have that connotation of it being fake, that it has to do with us coming up with images as opposed to the symbol, the name, and as opposed to the real, which exists before either of these things happen, the raw, before we make an image and before we come up with the symbol. I want to bracket a little bit the discussion of the real, partly because this is where Derrida hangs his hat as wanting to rake Lacan over the coals for that kind of thing. But I don't think Lacan talks as much about the real in this essay as he does about the role of the subject Mm -hmm. being constituted by the symbolic. And that idea, I think, has a lot of legs that the way we interact with each other, the way our identities are derived, the way we even know things has to do with the way their signs are. And the relationship between those signs and what they quote unquote are is problematic. And Lacan, I think, wants to just say, well, we're not going to worry about it that much. And he uses this story to give an example in which the sign has no truth relationship at all with what it's signifying. No one knows what the letter says. You can hypothesize about it, but you don't really know. And in fact, it's never revealed, but it's all because of the way it's behaving as a symbol that regulates the interactions of the whole story. And that's why it's such a good example for what he's talking about is that you have something that it doesn't even matter what it actually is. It doesn't matter what the letter quote unquote actually says at all. Its content does not matter. It's just how it's functioning as a sign. And in fact, that sign, that symbol is interpreted, has different meanings for each of the different players. Actually, just a point of order. It doesn't have different meanings. Yeah, maybe that's a bad word. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you wouldn't say it has different meanings. What you would say is that the sign determines their role in relation to other subjects based on their relationship to it. And maybe this is a good segue into that part of the analysis. I was less enamored of that part, so why don't you explain it? (laughs) Oh, okay. So, as Dylan just said, we don't know what's actually in the letter. We just know that somehow it's going to impact different people in different ways. And in the first case, the sort of first player, he says there's two scenes in the story. There's the scene with the letter between the king, the queen, and the minister. And then there is the second scene, which is between the minister, the chief of police, and Dupin. And the chief of police is a stand-in for the queen because he's acting on her behalf. So, in the first scene where you have the king, the queen, and the minister, there are three roles. So, the first role is that of the king. Lacan says the king is essentially blind or rather he sees nothing. So, he doesn't notice that the letter exists or if he does, it has no significance to him. So, he's sort of ignorant, if you will. Then there's the second role, which in the first scene is played by the queen, 
And in that role, you see what's going on and you act under the assumption that you're in control, I guess, of something. So the queen knows what's happening with the letter. She thinks she can hide it in plain sight and it works to dupe the king, but it doesn't work to dupe the minister. So that second position, I think he calls the seer or something like that. So there's see nothing. There's the see the first, and but is deluded about their ability to affect something. And then there's the third role, which in the first scene is the minister, who sees both the person who sees nothing as well as the one who sees but is deluded. I don't really know how you would describe that. Maybe the robber. This is on page 32. He says, Thus three moments, structuring three glances, borne by three subjects, incarnated each time by different characters. First is a glance that sees nothing the king and the police. The second, a glance which sees that the first sees nothing and deludes itself as to the secrecy of what it hides, the queen, then the minister. The third, sees that the first two glances leave what should be hidden exposed to whoever would seize it, the minister and finally Dupin. Yeah, I was going to read the paragraph right after that because I like this image. In order to grasp in its unity the intersubjective complex thus described, we would willingly seek a model in the technique legendarily attributed to the ostrich attempting to shield itself from danger. But that technique might ultimately be qualified as political, divided as it is here among three partners. The second believing itself invisible because the first has stuck its head in the ground, and all the while letting the third calmly pluck its rear. So the politics of the ostrich. (laughs) (laughs) Right. What is it, the... One buries the head and doesn't see. The second one sees that the first is buried in head and thinks it's okay, but all the while the third is plucking feathers out of its ass. Is that the the image? Right. I think it's purposely a sort of semi-nonsensical flourish, just playing on this issue of a... No, but that's only something that would make sense if a single...